Welcome to the ACT, uh, ACT and Region chapter of the Australian Citizen Science presentation by Laurie Gould, uh, The Travels and Home of the Latham Snipe. I will shortly introduce Laurie, uh, but first some housekeeping. Please stay muted throughout the presentation and for bandwidth considerations, you may consider turning off your video. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat and we will ask them at the end of the session. The session today will be recorded and I suspect you probably heard me turn on the recording and I will make it available in the next couple of days after the presentation. Now introductions. Laurie currently runs an environmental consulting business, Grassroots Environmental, uh, and specializes in natural resource management, particularly riparian rehabilitation, landscape planning and community engagement. Prior to this, Laurie was a program manager with the Jerobomba Wetlands for five years, 16 years with Greening Australia, specializing in riparian, riparian and catchment management program and uh, to involve water quality and biodiversity in rural Australia. And before this, uh, with park, as a park ranger with the ACT Parks and Conservation Service for six years. Laurie holds a master's degree in um, integrated water management, a postgraduate certificate in river restoration and management, an environmental sciences degree, and an associate diploma in animal science. Laurie is also a fellow of the Peter Cullen Trust. Laurie started, the, uh, Laurie started a PhD in migratory bird ecology in March 2021, uh, focusing on the Latham snipe, uh, Latham's snipe at the Derrimomba wetlands after being involved with the research on the snipe for over uh, five years. Over to you, Laurie. Thanks, John. <laughs> I didn't expect that big introduction. Um, just by way of clarifying, I'm about to, I'm enrolled in the Latham Snipe um, Migratory Bird Ecology PhD, but it doesn't start for another month or so. So I'm just embarking on that now. Um, <clears throat> and I wasn't going to do a PhD, but being like this opportunity arose um, to study this, this bird that I absolutely love. And so um, I leapt at it. So not that I really needed anything else to do, but, um, but yeah, I'm quite passionate about it. And it obviously is the topic of today's talk. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people. The picture that you see behind me was a artwork called River Dreaming and it was painted by a Ngunnawal elder, Richie Allen um, from Traditional, Owner, uh, Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation. And we work very closely with him um, at the River Restoration Centre and in various other endeavours. So, um, <clears throat> So yes, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and future leaders. Um, so what I will do now is share my screen, which usually works. Recording in progress. Can everyone, can everyone see that? John, can you see that? <laughs> yes, all good. Okay, right, we'll start, thank you. So the Latham snipe, um, I, I guess in your, with, with the citizen um, science, probably have come across this bird in the past. It's a, a cryptic little bird. It's a caramel mottled colour with a really long beak. It's a wader bird that we actually share with Japan. So it's really interesting. It over in Japan, <laughs> and it comes to Australia to overwinter, but it doesn't breed here. It just um, feeds really before it goes back again. So it's, its behaviour is quite different between Japan and Australia, which I always find really interesting because in Japan they fly around, they're really noisy, they dive bomb, really, really um, obvious. Everyone knows what they are. In Australia, they just virtually just sit in tussocks near wetlands and they roost during the day and they go out at night to feed. So sometimes you're lucky enough to see them out and about in the day, but more often than not, they're out um, flying around looking for bugs at night. So they just probe the mud with those big long beaks. So they've got quite specific habitat requirements. They need uh, cover and they need mud, just the right amount of mud to host a range of bugs. Uh, and they also need water nearby. So we have a lot of these birds at the Jerobomba wetlands, quite a stronghold, which is how we actually um, got interested in doing this project. 
But before I talk about that, I will just tell you a bit of background about how the Latham Snipe project began. So in Port Ferry, about, it would be nearly 10 years ago now, there was plans by council, Port Ferry's in Victoria, which is that bottom dot there. Most of you probably know that, but I thought I'd explain. Um, the council was going to develop some land, which is the usual swampy land that um, apparently nobody cares about. And when they were doing the environmental impact assessment, it was revealed that there was Latham snipe there. And they, if you have more than 18 birds, it actually triggers the Environment Protection, uh, EPBC Act, Environment Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, I hope I've got that right. Um, and that means that it has to go to a full scale EIS. However, it didn't seem to make a lot of difference in this case. And they were planning on putting houses on these wetlands. But luckily, there was the South Beach Wetlands and Landcare Group who really cared about these swamps. And they went and engaged an expert. Her name was or is Begita Hansen from Federation University, but she's also in the Victorian Way to, Way to Bird Study Group. And she's um, held various positions in that organisation. So they called her in as an expert witness at the Land and Environment Court. And they had a bit of a, a win in that they saved a wetland called Powling Street Wetlands. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of wetlands in that area weren't saved. They ended up being developed, but this important one was. And so even though the group feels like it's a mixed result in terms of the fact that some of the wetlands got developed, I think that given the stronghold of snipe in this particular area, it was actually quite a big win. It started the Latham Snipe project uh, and has since grown into a large national and international collaborative project with a huge community effort. And I think that's one of the features of the project, which I'll talk about as I um, move on. But um, by doing this, it meant that the community was behind protecting these birds. And so when we at the wetlands in Canberra, Jarabomba Wetlands got interested in finding out more about these cryptic little birds, the first port of call was to find other people who were doing similar work on the snipe. And interesting, we've actually, interestingly, we've now developed the Latham Snipe Project has no owner. Um, it's sort of a collaboration federate between Federation University and a whole bunch of other partners. So what I love about this is no one really owns it. It's just a sort of a, a project that we all work on. So the partners, we've got people, the Wild Bird Society of Japan, um, the Woodlands and Wetlands Trust to manage the Jerobomba Wetlands. Australia Japan Foundation's been <coughs> helping to support some of the activities we do. ACT Government, Rotary, uh, Victorian Way to Study Group, Federation Uni, the Landcare Group down in Port Ferry. And one of our biggest contributors and partners is the Canberra Ornithologist Group who help us with just about every aspect of the project um, and quite a lot of them. So we've just got this wonderful collaboration of all different people. We don't have a logo fest, we just have the Latham Snipe project and everybody contributes in different ways. So similarly, everyone's welcome to get involved in whatever way is appropriate. So we've undertaken a lot of activities since 2015 in both Japan and Australia. So we've been, um, when I say we, I'm talking about all of the collective partners. So we've been attaching leg flags and we've probably put leg flags on between um, Port Ferry and Canberra. We're in excess of 150 birds, but <clears throat> the Japanese have put a thousand uh, leg flags. Interestingly, they put blue leg flags on and we haven't seen any blue leg flags in Canberra or Port Ferry, but our orange leg flags that we put on in Canberra, <coughs> the birds return. So they come back to the areas that we, we flagged to them. So we find that really, it's a bit of a mystery why the Japanese ones aren't being sighted here. Um, we've also done satellite tracking where we fix real time satellite trackers to birds. Geolocators are much cheaper than satellite, but you have to catch the bird back. They just uh, glue onto the leg flag. Radio tracking, where they have a little um, a transmitter glued onto their back, their tail, well, it's a bit further up the back on their feathers. 
and that molts off within a couple of months. So you just get a little bit of a window into what they're doing. We have surveys, really intensive surveys around Canberra, and we also have national bird surveys three on three specific days of the year where people go out um, and they have to do it on that one day so we don't end up with double counts and, and all the other um, issues about doing it across a broader time frame. Um, but there are hundreds of volunteers around. The, the birds, the snipe are really limited to the east coast, well, the eastern part of Australia, so not just the coast, but they're not really found wet around the west of Australia. So <clears throat> catching snipe, I thought I would, I'm going to talk about those things um, as we go, but I just thought I'd give you a bit of an insight into catching snipe because it is not an easy task. So, and you can see lots of different ages and, and um, all different people that come and help. Um, including people from Japan <clears throat> that come to visit. And we also go to Japan to help them at, on occasion. But really, <clears throat> it's, it's a matter of, say, for example, spending Saturday night out in the swamp with the aroma of decomposition, half of Australia's insect population. You can't see very well. And occasionally you might get a wasp or a leak in your waders. So it's pretty intensive work. It's very hard to wade through the mud in the wetlands as well. However, in spite of that, we have a lot of volunteers that come and help. So I'm not sure whether it's the appeal of the Jerobombra Wetland Centre, which is effectively a demountable. You can, you can see it there in the bottom left-hand corner. And you can have a, a floor space for free if you bring your own sleeping bag. So we get people camping out overnight. And what we need to do is we go and put the nets up in the evening. It can take until about midnight, they're mist nets. We leave them rolled up, we get about four hours sleep, go back out at four o'clock in the morning, unfurl them. Then we wait another hour or so, we assemble the rest of the team and we flush the birds into the mist nets. The reason this works is because the birds go off to feed. So we watch them leave of an evening, we race out, put up our nets, and then when they come back in the morning, you've got a window of about 10 minutes to catch them. And we've got this down to a fine art. Um, I did learn, though, not to make economiyaki for our Japanese guests. They were very polite, but um, I'm not doing it again. We're all having dom Domino's pizzas. But anyone's welcome to come and join these catches. And at the end of the show, um, the presentation, I have my details so if anyone wants to be on a list to keep up to date with what the project's doing or get involved that's we welcome everybody in this project um but to put it all in perspective this may seem like hard work but to catch the very first snipe down in port ferry took six weeks so you can imagine going out and doing that for six weeks and not actually catching any birds at all so we're very grateful for those people doing the hard yards in the first instance, because now we have it down to a fine art. Um, in addition to going out all night catching the birds, um, we had we are satellite tracking. We had chest harnesses that we put on the birds. Um, and in order to make sure they were safe, we had to hold on to them for 24 hours. And to do that, we had to actually construct a whole wetland in the Jerobomba Wetland Centre. So this required everybody collecting mud and plants and water. And we had to go through the compost to get bugs and maggots and everything else that we could find um, to set up, the, set up a wetland, which ended up looking like that, which is a tent, the inner part of a tent. We had a GoPro set up so we could film and watch the birds without disturbing them. We covered up all the windows and no one was allowed in there um, unless there was an issue. So it was very dark in there. We were simulating night um, for the night that we were holding on to them. And then we would give them a good check and let them go in the morning. So we did this for a few years. Um, but I'm pleased to say this year the Japanese were trialling a leg loop harness and that we, we uh, emulated that this, this last catching season and that's worked really well. We only have to hold on to the birds for about half an hour, an hour and they're fine. The problem with the chest harnesses is the bird's beak can get stuck in them and you want to ensure that doesn't happen before 
releasing. So it was a relief not having to build a wetland again. But having said that, it was quite fun at the time. Lots of people together having a lot of laughs. So the satellite tracking we have undertaken in Canberra, in, I don't think, no, we haven't done Port Ferry and up in Hokkaido, up in Japan. And so the Japanese have tracked five birds, um, I think it was 2016, and they ended up tracking two birds as far as Papua New Guinea. A year later, we had three birds that we were tracking and we got a lot of local movement data. One of our birds went up to Guaida wetlands before we lost the track. Um, the technology and the harnesses weren't as good back then, but it's interesting that we found that um, all of our birds, whether they're coming out of Japan or out of Canberra, were, it's interesting they seem to stage at a similar wetlands in Papua New Guinea. So that sort of opened up another line of inquiry. And then, um, and we've also found that they were actually hanging around in the cane fields up in Northern Queensland, which was interesting. So it must've been a good, good cover, mud and water for them. But um, one of the really interesting things is we can demonstrate the use of habitat within the ACT, particularly with the wetlands being surrounded by a lot of development um, with East Lake and the, whole, and, and the Malonglo group next door to the wetlands. So we can, feed a lot of information into that uh, process of, of the EIAs and everything, environmental impact assessments, so that they have good data to make decisions on and we can protect habitat. Um, I'll just put the, so this year, we so the update to that is this year, the Japanese with their new leg loop harnesses released three birds. They all ended up in Australia and it's interesting when the birds come from us, from Japan to Australia, the fastest one we recorded was three days that got here to Northern Queensland, which is, means it was traveling about the about 100 kilometers an hour and it's the second fastest recorded migration. So that was really interesting, but going back to Japan, they can take months, like our birds were, I think a couple of months and they'd got up, got as far as Queensland. So it's interesting, it must be to do with the winds. The other interesting thing is that the juveniles leave Hokkaido two weeks after the adults and come here. So we're not really, no one's really sure um, why or how they know where they're going. Um, still a bit of a mystery, but anyway, we can look into that a bit more. So the Japanese, interestingly, one of the birds came to Canberra and it settled itself. Well, when I say Canberra, I mean the ACT settled itself in Namaji National Park, right down south near the border of the ACT. So the Wild Bird Society, the fellow's name's Tatsuya, the researcher there, kept sending all the updates to us, all the, um, the locations of where the bird had been tracked to, and we plotted them all. This, this, only, this map here down on the bottom left only just shows a couple of them, but because the error margin in the data, it can be a kilometre or more, we sort of did a bit of triangulation and, and the best habitat is a, that sort of little lower Bobian swamp area near the old Bobian Road, which for people who know is right down near Mount Clear campground. So me and my daughter went out and had a good look at the habitat, um, which is there in the bottom right photo. It's really lovely habitat for snipe. We walked and walked and walked and we didn't see any snipe, but um, the habitat where the actual tracks were shown was sort of at the top of a hill in woodland areas with no water. So we sort of, we felt that that being in the middle of all of those tracks was the likely habitat. So it, what the beauty of the partnership with the Wild Bird Society is we could go down and have a look at that, take all these photos, and then we sent them back to Tatsuya so he could see um, where his bird was, um, for want of a better way of describing it. And of course, I sent a photo of myself and Kelly to him just to remind him because <laughs> we've, we've been over there a few times visiting and helping him work on the snipe so there's a lovely um, you know friendship developed and and that sort of thing so it's, that's one of the things that I really love about this project it's the relationships more so than the bird in some ways and so um, that bird is now gone out to Kosciuszko National Park um, we're just waiting for the next lot of updates from Tatsuya 
And our birds that we've tracked this year, when I say this year, we put the trackers on in December, we put up trackers on three birds. Interestingly, it was the largest single catch we have had of Latham snipe ever in this project. And we think it's just because of all the rain. I mean, the some of the wetlands were getting in excess of um, 80 birds out on counted out on the peninsula at the Jarabomba wetlands. And we've had 30 or 40 um, in areas where before we would be lucky to count five. So there's certainly the rain we think's had a lot to do with that. Um, so just by way of explanation, um, the squares are ELF 50, which is one bird, which we called Kenma, which means healthy in Japanese. And then the triangles are ELF 51, which we called Natsu, which means summer in Japanese. The lead researcher, Begita Hansen, hates naming the birds because she's, she's superstitious, so she gets annoyed. But the kids and everybody love coming up with names. So we pretty much named, we've had Nozomi, which means hope, and Zubasa, which means wing, and we've got names for all of our birds. But communicating with Begita, I, we get it in ELF 50s or ELF 51s. So the picture shows the blue is the midnight fixes. So you can see they're up north of the Jarabomba wetlands near what we call the paleo channels. And that's where they're feeding. So there's, it's, it's kind of a rotationally grazed area with cattle and they pug up the dams up there. They're, they're actually um, at the wetlands to manage the height of the grass for the snipe, believe it or not. Um, and the landholder that has those, adjusts those cattle there, just moves them around upon instructions from the ranger. Um, but they do love the mud, they love feeding in the mud. And then during the daytime, which is green, our midday fixes, they're all roosting up around Kelly's Swamp. Uh, and they particularly love the billabong area. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, possibly not. But the four triangles that are down to the south, southern end of the map, um, they really love roosting there. And the importance of that is that the area next door being developed um, needs to take into account the impact that any kind of access may have on the birds that roost in that area during the day. Uh, they don't mind light, they don't mind seem to mind noise or construction, but they really hate being disturbed by people or dogs or anything. So we've been able to use that data to feed back into the environmental impact assessment for the development of that area. So it's been very, very useful. So we're, these birds are still out and about and we provide updates every so often. So as I said, if you want to um, be on the list, it's just a, an email out from me, um, just telling people where the birds are and providing maps. And lately, now you might have to look a bit closely, but um, Kenma, has decided to leave the wetlands and go over to the National Equestrian Centre down in the bottom left of the screen there, the squares, the blue, and, and it seems to be spending night and day in that location. So that's really interesting. Whereas Natsu is still hanging around at the wetlands. So we're finding it all very interesting because none of our birds before have actually left the wetlands. So we're just watching that and, and, and like I said, I've just provide updates every, we get the data maybe once a week or something and I provide an update every two or three weeks if anyone wants to find out more as we go along. I'm heading out there on the weekend to have a look at the equestrian centre just to see if, where they're hanging around, but it looks like there's a, a dam out there with some good vegetation around it, which we'll have a look at on the Cotter Road. And then we've got the geolocator, so the satellite costs about $6,000 per tracker. Uh, so you can imagine it's not a cheap option. Whereas the geolocators only cost about $300 each. So our way of thinking is one of the big findings that we've got from all of this work, particularly the leg flag resightings, is that our birds come back. So we put a leg flag on, it flies to Japan, and then they come back again to the same place. And we've had about seven birds do that, and they, but they've also been recited often at the wetlands, um, you know, several times a season. Uh, so with the geolocators, we thought, well, if we put quite a lot of them on, and as I said, they're just glued onto a leg flag, so they don't harm the bird in any way, 
um, we thought we put a lot on and hoped that we'd just catch the occasional one back. Um, very long shot, I must say. But amazingly, T0, which is the very first bird that was ever caught in Port Ferry, that took six weeks to catch. They affixed it with a geolocator. And that was one of the birds that they re-caught and they recaptured it 100 metres away from where they put the geolocator on the bird. So everyone was astounded. And what they found too is that they, they were able to track the map, track it on the map, which is the right hand um, set of images there on the slide. Um, they could see where it went to get up to Hokkaido, how it got back. It's very, it's not as fine scale as the satellite, obviously, but it works on light and dark and salinity and you actually align it with latitude and longitude. So there's a few calculations when you get the, the geolocator back. But basically that top right hand image plots um, the, the light and the dark and, and how it linked to latitude. But if you look at the fuzzy bit in the middle, that was uh, thought to be, or quite certain um, to be when the bird was sitting on eggs. So it looks like it's bred and then it's come all the way back to Port Ferry again and, and been recaptured 100 metres from where it was released. So that was really amazing. But then in Canberra, a few couple of years later, we actually had the same experience. So we caught, we re-caught a bird with a geolocator and then we could plot its flight path. And you can see the picture on the left, it's not, Plotting is not all that straightforward or particularly accurate. Um, there's a huge margin of error, but you can actually work out where the bird went. Um, and you can see that the flight up is the unbroken line, the unbroken arrows, and then the flight back is the dotted arrows and where it's come back to Jerobomba wetlands. But this bird interestingly went and bred in Japan. So we didn't know they went that far north to breed. Um, a lot of this work with, with this project is the first, you know, uncovering of a lot of information about snipe, which wasn't previously available. Um, so, yeah, so Begida's made contact with, I think there is an interest group in Russia because, unfortunately, in Russia, a lot of people still shoot snipe. So she's been working with the Russian bird enthusiasts, and I can't remember the name of the group, to just find out more about the snipe and, and ways in which we can conserve it. So that's really exciting news. So we're hoping now uh, between the Japanese tracked birds and our tracked birds, of which one um, satellite tracker has actually stopped um, transmitting. So we've got two birds that we're tracking and then three from Japan. So we're hoping we can get a migration in satellite, but at the moment the geolocators are proving quite useful. The other really important thing about the satellite is you get the local movements and local habitat data for reasons, as I mentioned earlier, about developments and other uh, feeding into the migratory action plan in the ACT that's been put together, of which SNIPE are a, a central feature. So apart from the geolocators, um, the biggest thing we found, apart from the site loyalty um, and local movements and also how to catch, so they're the big things we found. But then we thought, well, we don't have a lot of data about snipe in the ACT and their occurrence. All of the information in the migratory action plan um, in the ACT was about records and records don't necessarily determine um, how many birds there are in a site. It, it's de it really just shows you effort. So for example, Jerobomba Wetlands has a lot of records for snipe because lots of people go there and see them. Whereas out at Namachi National Park, for example, you know, there's the odd record, but it's mainly because we've not got the same survey effort out there. So what we attempted to do, we, we went and found every single um, site that a snipe had been recorded um, at in Canberra and, and massive effort by the Canberra Ornithologist Group. They have just been unbelievable. Um, 
we put the call out. We said, here's all the sites. Who wants to survey them? Once a month on the same weekend, we didn't specify which day because we needed to make it workable for the volunteers and that was good enough to get good records. It turned out we had so much interest. So they had to do this for eight months. So it was no um, small feat in their spare time every, every month. Um, 29 sites ended up being surveyed on the same weekend every month. So we got this fantastic data set of all, and, and this included a lot of people going out and recording zero counts because they might have got a site, the Chapman Horse Paddocks, ironically, turned up a zero count every single month for the whole survey period. And now that is the area near um, where our snipe have been tracked to this year. So the zero counts are really important, but it takes a lot of um, commitment to continually be getting no birds. So anyway, from all this work in 2016, we were able to find our hotspots. And since then, we just um, have volunteers go out and survey our hotspot areas. It's three times a year and it correlates with the national surveys. So in September, November and January on a single day, people go out and survey their site. As I mentioned earlier, hundreds of sites around Australia and then our hotspot sites feed into that data, which is um, collated by Bogita and Federation University. So we've got this wonderful data set. Um, yeah, I just can't thank Canberra Ornithologists Group enough. They are still involved, heavily involved in the project, but that was one no small effort. And in fact, one of the, um, I don't know if people are aware of Jeffrey Dabb, um, he's one of our sort of birdo photographers. He actually did this artwork and um, put it on Facebook for us about the snipe survey. So people were just wonderful about it. The other fantastic um, volunteer effort is all of the photographers and birders that are always at the wetlands there. They really are our eyes and ears. Um, you know, they get these amazing photos. They can, and what we keep saying to them, if you're going to get a photo, can you please try to get the leg flag number, which is just brilliant. And you can see in those photos, you know, you can clearly read the number and, and we're just getting some wonderful photos from them. So um, we take, we've took a, taken the approach with the volunteers. Um, we've got, we, we always openly communicate with everyone. There's a bird chat line, regular communication, warts and all. When things go wrong, um, everyone knows about it because what we've found is by building that trust with the bird community, when we do need the help in finding a bird or reporting any issue, um, if there's a problem with one of the birds, because we built that trust, they will come and help us to resolve it rather than, um, which is what often happens is if people don't have enough knowledge, they get worried and then um, things can blow out of all proportion. So the people that get around the wetlands really have been invaluable. And so what we ended up doing um, is making a tea towel and some socks to go with the project. So these were um, designed by volunteers and the tea towel on the left, the, the, the wording there is oji shigi, which is Japanese for, for late, well, they don't call it Latham snipe, they call it the great snipe. And it, it shows the orange leg flags of the birds in, in Australia and the blue leg flags of the birds in the, the, put on in Japan. And so we sell, we, well, we, we haven't recently, but we were selling the tea towels to raise money for the project, as well as the socks, snipe socks. And um, so, for example, the ACT government bought 200 tea towels to give to everyone that attended the Land Care Awards in the ACT with a little card that explained about the project. But um, we also give them out as prizes to our um, bird photographers and everyone else when we're looking for a specific bird. So we might get a report of number 74 snipe and then we put the word out and say, can someone get a photo of the leg flag? And, and we also sometimes throw in the odd bottle of champagne if it's, if it's something we really want. And, and it's become a really lighthearted um, engagement um, process with everybody. Um, and 
when we went overseas, we actually presented the mayor of Tamokamai in Hokkaido with a tea towel, and he was incredibly happy with it. But um, I'll show you a photo of that in a minute. Oh, it's on the next page. That's handy. Um, so there we all are. Um, we took, we had it with the Australia Japan Foundation provided some funding for us to take some young rangers, so five kids to Japan, um, to, in, to interact with the school children in Japan. It was all about international relationships. Um, we visited schools, we talked to researchers, we went and visited politicians, and the purpose of which was to raise awareness about the importance of Latham Snipe and um, the importance of protecting habitat. So, we were interviewed by their news, the, the mayor who is in the top two photos there, that's us presenting one of our tea towels to him. Um, he was incredibly interested and he was so proud to have the bird in his part of the world, in Tamakamai and the wetlands up there. And he ended up, and, and it was good for the Wild, the Wild Bird Society of Japan because it gave them reason to get an audience with him as well. Um, obviously we all had a really fun time while we were there, but. Um, we had this great uh, opportunity to share information about our bird. Uh, there we all are in the field. And in fact, that left-hand photo is Tatsuya, the researcher that we work with. Funnily enough, when we were staying at Lake Utenai, which is in Tamakamai, the park was closed because there was a bear on the loose. So we didn't get to spend a lot of time in the outside of the wetland centre, which was beautiful, I might add, with lots of telescopes and everything. But um, but yeah, it was, became a bit of a joke that people kept trying to sneak in the park to look at the birds in spite of the bear, but it was a wonderful experience. And then uh, the young rangers in Japan who we'd spent time with a year later decided to come to Australia in a similar program. They were funded through their equivalent. Um, and so they brought 14 kids out and a number of parents and it was just fantastic. The tricky thing was, though, that it was in the middle of the bushfires in Canberra and in spite of me saying you can't breathe the smoke and everything else, they were still really keen and they were only coming to Canberra and they were only coming to spend a week to get to know about the snipe and to come and see some, some things in Canberra. So it, here they are in the smoke haze, um, but we managed to get them out and about to... Mulligan's Flat and to the Botanic Gardens and other areas where they could actually just go and, um, you know, see some birds and have a look around. But nearly every every facility was closed because of the smoke. So places like Questacon and other, other attractions that we might have otherwise shown them were actually um, closed. But we, we, we all had such a great time. Uh, and so that, those relationships are still in place. And, and if it wasn't for COVID, I suspect we probably would have been back again. We're just waiting to see what happens in that space. I'm hoping in the next three years with the PhD will be opportunities to go and work with the Wild Bird Society again. Um, <clears throat> so the outcomes of the project so far is that, um, as I mentioned, we've learned to catch snipe, which is massive. We've learned they're very loyal to their sites. Um, we've got a lot of information on local movements and the importance of local habitat around the Canberra region. But we also have lots of information about numbers in different parts of Australia that are now comparable. We know the hotspots in Canberra. Now, one of the problems with our Canberra hotspots is that we only know the lowland areas. So, the gap that we're trying to fill at the moment is the higher country. So up around Imagi, we're trying to survey sites uh, in that part of the world. The problem is they're so vast, some of those swampy meadows and wetlands that um, we, we have done surveys, again, with Canberra Ornithologist Group in a rural and nursery swamp and Bobian. Um, we haven't quite got the sort of, I guess, the uh, and interestingly, the sites we chose, which we thought would be good, are not the sites that the bird from Japan has travelled to. So we need to do a bit more work in that area. Um, we've worked out our tracking methodologies with the geolocators and the, the satellites, and we've also now got the leg harness, leg loop harness, which seems to be working really well. Um, and we've also been able to feed into development areas like the urban wetlands, um, 
there was some habitat that needed to be replaced on Horse Park Drive, which was already half built. Uh, the developers there were happy to reconstruct that wetland habitat with the information. Similarly, with the Billabong area at Jerobomba Wetlands, um, plans to put paths and things close to that area are now being rethought on the basis of this data. We're also getting a better understanding of our national populations, which were thought to be in decline, um, but we're getting a better handle. They are declining, but um, we're starting to get a better handle on numbers. And the idea of, of working on this bird and getting to understand what its needs are, apart from within the context of migratory birds more broadly, is that they're a, they're a bird that isn't yet they're protected as a migratory species, but they're not yet threatened or vulnerable. And we're not, we, we've got a decent population that if we intervene early and understand early, uh, are at less risk potentially of, um, of, of declining in numbers that are unsustainable. So um, there's a lot going on and I really encourage anyone who wants to be involved in this project. You don't have to do any more than just keep up to date. You can get involved as much or as little as you want. Um, people come in and out. We've got a core team that seem to come every catch, but people will just come and go as they've got time and, and that's fine. So we've got a really open-armed approach to the project. So there, it, there's a Latham Snipe project. Um, website, which we put a blog on, we, the collective we, it's usually Begito, um, put a blog on about once a month to keep up to date with the broad national program and international program. And then if you email me, um, I can put you on my list, which I just update people sort of in, in the region. And that's more fine scale. What we're doing at the wetlands, do you want to get involved? Um, all of that sort of thing. So I will leave it at that um, and thank you for listening and hopefully I will see some of you in the next few years. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Laurie. Um, I'm sure I, I've certainly, certainly learnt lots. One that, you know, if not carefully going to get caught for speeding, coming, coming down from Japan in three <laughs> days at 100k an hour. I know. Um, <laughs> so we've had a couple, couple of questions come out of the out of it. Um, Vlad, uh, was uh, wondering if anyone was aware of any similar volunteer programs around Sydney um, saying he'd like to get involved. He did get some responses, but are you, you might be able to um, provide any uh, other information. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I know um, we are mainly in Victoria and the ACT. I'm just not sure. We haven't got anyone in Sydney that does any similar work, but that doesn't mean someone else doesn't do something <laughs> it might not be yeah. on latham snipe but i'm sure if you get in touch with your local bird groups or i know there's some really active people around barrel um who we work with but um yeah i'm sure there'll be something some projects down that way that have a similar right. yeah. feel based, based on friends of mine those that get involved with bird watching are, are keen to be involved in more bird watching um, and all yeah. sorts of things like that yeah um, Another question we had was, what height are these birds flying across oceans? Gosh, I couldn't tell you that. That would be a Begita question. <laughs> <laughs> I will put that, I'll, I'll feed back that information to you and you can email it out if you like. If, yeah, if you can, I'll include it with the, yeah, um, the video link when, tell it, you the when it goes out. That. Yeah, yeah, I'll note down here to follow up. <laughs> um, Vlad's also, um, said basically well done um, on the, the, the development of the relationship between volunteers in Australia and Japan and the students involvement. Uh, so we've got one from Andy, um, great project to mark the importance of bird conservation. Did you get any interest um, from the pollies? Yeah, so we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of sort of media. And um, so we do a lot on the, with the ABC and there's been television um, stories on it and there's been a documentary made about it. We had television crews following us around for one of our, well, for a whole week, really. They even came to our house, <laughs> just following us and the, the Japanese researchers around. So it's been, a, I guess, a lot of coverage and that's translated into getting funding from the ACT government ongoing. 
um, for at least, I think it was three years or something in terms of the migratory action plan they developed. And at the federal level, it tends to be the Australia Japan Foundation and DFAT. Um, more broadly than that, not so much, but I guess, and, and certainly in Japan, there's been a lot of political interest, but I think here we haven't, we probably haven't pursued that as much as we could because we were still able to achieve what we wanted to achieve with what we had. So, um, yeah, there's certainly a number, of, mainly local politicians aware of it, because whenever they need a, a good news story or something, they'll approach us. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs>